heard in the introduction, I'm Helen Lewis, and we'll introduce the speaker so you can see and put a face to a name as we go along. But really, we're all here because the world of work is changing incredibly fast. We already know about automation, AI, but we also know about the political challenges. The problem has not been in the last 10 years of unemployment, but of underemployment. We have the problem of zero hours working, of a gig economy that provides very fragile gains. Some of the things that we fought for in the world of work, like a defined working week, are being eroded. And also, how well have we designed the world of work? You know, is it, if you're starting to design it again today, would it look anything like it does? Those are the kind of big questions that we're going to be talking about today. But first of all, I'm going to put a different question to each of my speakers. I'm going to start off with you, Jamie Suskin, and talk about, we, we kind of very glibly say things about, you know, AI will completely change the world of work. But really, what are the technological changes that will have the biggest impact on the world of work in the next 10 to 20 years? Well, I do think it's going to be artificial intelligence. The story of the week this week was that there are now systems that can predict uh, human, the likelihood of death from heart disease better than the best human experts. There are already systems that can predict uh, similarly in relation to cancers, can tell the difference between a, a cancerous melanoma and a harmless freckle better than the best human experts. AI systems are increasingly better than human beings at various tasks, from the games that we play, whether it's chess or Go, to things like lip reading or mimicking human speech, or even detecting whether a smile is a real smile or a fake smile. And we're sometimes asked these days, do you live to work or do you work to live? In the future, we, we, may, knew, we, we may do neither, because if you consider the jobs that we do as bundles of economically useful tasks, and you break our jobs down into those tasks, an increasing number of them, uh, it'll become economically efficient for machines or digital systems to do them rather than humans. And you need to imagine a world of 100% technological unemployment for this to represent a pretty big change in the way that our economy is structured. If even 10 or 20 or 30% of us were put out of work by machines, consider that there are three and a half million truckers in America, for instance, that would represent quite a significant economic upheaval. And in my work, I try to see the positives in this. I'm not sure if it's me doing that beatbox just now. Is it me? I don't think it is me. Um. <laughs> Let's continue as if that's part of your act. I, how's that? Yeah. I feel like I'm being trolled. <laughs> I mean, if, if you turn the mic off, I can see without it. Well, can everybody hear me if I just project like this? Yeah. Right. So the final thing I was, just, I was going to say is um, we... Uh, thank you. Shall I start again? No. <laughs> um. Where do you sit on that optimist versus pessimist line? Of, you know, from the kind of, the robots are going to take all our jobs to robots are going to create new jobs. And, uh, you know, where, where on that line are you? Well, the, I, I'm more towards the pessimistic side, although I don't necessarily see it always as a downside. The reason for that is, it, even if machines do create more jobs as they destroy them, you then have to ask the question about whether those new jobs themselves can be done better by human beings or machines. And if the logic that I've outlined is correct, and that over time, digital systems and ro robots are able to do things better than we are on a greater and greater scale, then even the new jobs that are created will be taken by uh, machines as well. The reason I don't see it necessarily as a bad thing is that I, do, I think it's an artificial link that we have currently between work and income and work and status and self-esteem and work and well-being. And there might be ways in the future that we can meet those needs even if we're not all in what might be considered now gainful employment. Well, that seems a good point to you, bring you in, Nick Cernick, because you've written a lot about a more radical approach to thinking about our world of work, right? A lot of the solutions that we talk about are often quite small scale, aimed at kind of very much ameliorating some of the problems. But instead, is there a kind of space for a conversation that is just fundamentally rethinking from the roots our idea about what work is? Yeah, I think there is. Um, so a quick show of hands, how many people hate Mondays? Okay, quite a few of you, maybe not as many as I expected. <laughs> But the reason why we hate Mondays, of course, is because the weekend is over, we have to go back to work. Uh, most of us may enjoy aspects of our jobs, but most of us would probably be, be, would prefer to do something else other than work. So very much like Jamie suggests, these new technologies, this potential for robots and AI to take jobs, I think we should see this as a potential to liberate us from drudgery, from work. Uh, it should allow us to expand our free time, 
But of course, we have to completely rethink the way that we organize societies. We have to rethink the way that we organize the link between work and income. Uh, we have to completely rethink the way in which we you know, build our identities. So that's sort of what, uh, where my work steps off from, is to say that actually we shouldn't look at the sort of potential threat of automation. Uh, we should look at it as an opportunity to actually rebuild our societies in a completely different and much better way. If we look historically as well, you go back to say the early 1900s, the average work week was about 60 hours. And of course the labor movement then was pushing for a shorter and shorter working week. And around the time of the Great Depression, we finally get about a 40 hour work week. Now, for a variety of reasons, the Great Depression, World War II, that sort of push for shorter, shorter working week and more and more free time disappears after World War II. I think today, with these new technologies emerging, we can start to think about retaking that project, updating it for the 21st century, and starting to liberate all of us, uh, give us all more free time. Do you have a, an ideal working week that you think we should be aiming for now? I know the TUC talked about a four-day working week by 2050. Is that what we should be, that should be the political demand now? I think a three-day weekend sounds fantastic. Uh, that should be our short-term goal. Back in 1932, John Maynard Keynes very famously said, uh, he predicted that 100 years from then, his grandchildren would be working 15 hours a week. So three five-hour days, basically. I think, you know, we could aim for that in the long run. I think that's something where uh, John Maynard Keynes, far from being a radical, is something which is very plausible given the changes in technology. Joe Self, you come to this from an architectural perspective. How well have we designed the world of work as it currently stands, and our workplaces and, and the spaces in which we work? Uh, I mean, appallingly. Um, and in a way, I want to follow, follow up on, on what Nick mentioned, which is, of course, uh, I'm very interested in technology in the home and how that, um, how that changes our relationships with each other, the politics of the family, and so on. And of course, there is a narrative which began before World War II, but even actually after World War II, uh, continued in certain strains. If you look at um, certain visions of the future, um, particularly those presented by people like Disney in the 50s uh, in America, there was an idea that in the future we would uh, mainly be made up of um, kind of uh, men who would go and uh, to a factory for a few hours a day and ov mainly oversee other uh, forms of production, and that their wives would presumably spend most of their time in their kind of Californian bungalows playing uh, tennis. Now. This vision was a kind of natural consequence of a idea about technology and work in the home which had really begun in the 19th century, which was that there were two reasons for introducing technology to the home. The first was the promotion of uh, leisure. The more that the man of the household in this kind of traditional heteronormative family structure, the more that they were relaxed and uh, uh, well rested, the more productive they would be at the factory. And the other uh, flip side of that entertainment technology was labor saving, um, which had to do with increasing the leisure and decreasing the burden on the housewife. So, you know, all of the things that are invented, um, the oven, uh, the gas oven, the electric hoover, uh, ultimately then the microwave and so on, technology has always been driven by this maximizing leisure and decreasing um, uh, requirements for labor. And in a way, that's kind of been perverted. I mean, when I look at things like Alexa and these other kind of smart home um, technologies. They appear to me extremely uh, banal and their advantages are not really very obvious because they make, they neither improve our leisure, uh, that is, they neither allow us to work less, um, nor do they, well, or, and they also don't allow us to reduce our labor in the home. So they're, they're, to me, they're a deeply suspicious uh, invention. Um, and I was thinking before I came out uh, about, you know, this space of, of work and particularly its relationship with architectural space and the home. And it's like, whatever happened to what you used to see in IKEA catalogs in the mid 2000s of the home office? Now, the home office is one of those spaces which has had almost no innovation in the last uh, decade and a half. Why is that? And then I was like, oh, yeah because the entire home is an office now. And in a way, the ubiquity of work, the fact that it's everywhere, the fact that you can be called upon at any moment through some notification or an email or alert to enter into this endless kind of flow of superfluous communication seems to me like maybe one of the first points uh, of, of resistance and struggle to pursue. Um, but why has it been so hard? Because I think it's fascinating if you look at the studies of 
say, women now spend you know, about the same amount of time with their children as they did in the 1950s when far fewer of them were at work, right? So what has happened, and we've had all this time allegedly given back to us by these time-saving devices, and we seem to have just filled it with more work. Well, I mean, Nick and I were discussing this in the uh, green room, uh, which is not green. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm new to this, so this is a surprise to me. Um, which is very much to do with the idea that children are increasingly viewed through economic dimensions as a kind of investment, and therefore you need to invest face time with your child in order to make sure that they get into the best schools. That they, I mean, Nick's better qualified than I to speak to this. Uh, but that, that kind of commodification of uh, child rearing and therefore the kind of metrics which are applied to every individual are kind of horrific. Well, let's bring in Stella Creasy, um, our final panelist, because you work in politics, uh, which has got a few other things on at the moment. It's all going swimmingly. It's, it's good. absolutely going swimmingly. <laughs> but how much, how serious are the conversations that you are able to have about really rethinking some of these, you know, some of these big ideas? Uh, I mean, I think it's fair to say you probably look at the, the House of Commons at the moment and don't exactly think it's going well. Um, and, I mean, I, I, so I think of Brexit as being like the Monty Python foot. It's kind of come down on everything and it's taking up everything. So actually a lot of these conversations just frankly aren't happening. So that's the first problem that you've got. The second problem that you've got, and it's a problem you have in politics across the piece, which is that politicians seek to impose their own ideas about what the future might look like on, on what happens. And you, can't, you can see that most clearly when it comes to the national curriculum and to actually how we're helping young people in this country address some of these challenges. So there is an obsession with repeating and opening up to the next generation the opportunities that my generation and the previous generation had, whether or not those opportunities, so for example, increased numbers of GCSEs, going to university, being able to do a university degree, are the right thing for this future generation. Um, I was very struck. I was on a school cuts march, and a young boy called Callum walked up to me. He was eight years old, and walking alongside him was the robot that he had made. And he was telling me about how he had another one at home that was able to solve Rubik's Cubes. And I just thought, I'd quite like to be Callum's mum, because I could probably retire. <laughs> um, the curriculum for Callum makes absolutely no sense at all. His mum, in fact, was talking to me about how she could help support his interest in robotics, his interest in creativity, outside of the school, because the curriculum at the moment is made for the presumption that each of us will find a single career that we will go into for life. So it's a question of skilling you into one set of careers. When we have the increasing evidence that young people will go into seven different industries, two of which haven't yet been invented, then asking everyone to do the same set of exams at the same time for a common set of qualifications doesn't make any sense. But just as with technology, I think it's Dom Tapsell who talks about people being digital natives versus digital immigrants. Well, frankly, a lot of people in government are digital refugees in that none of this stuff really makes much sense to them. And when you've got something as pressing and as urgent as what on earth are you going to do with Brexit on your table, then thinking creatively about how do we get to that four-day week when our competitors already have goes out the window. I'm not painting a very exciting picture for you, but I'm just being honest about at the moment in politics, it's easier for people to be frightened by these trends rather to engage with them. So what does it look like then, a, a world of work in which we make it easier for people to change careers and reskill? You know, if we talk about the, the hundred year life, you know, how much easier is it gonna be for somebody at the age of 50 to change well, jobs? You know, I, I have to say as an old fashioned socialist, I'm quite excited because I believe we are living through a Marxist revolution because the means of production are increasingly in the hands of the workers. You can actually now set up your own industry, create value, be your own boss in a way that 10, 15, 20 years ago was completely impossible. So in that sense, it is potentially a very exciting time. But what we're seeing with the new economy and whether people talk about the gig economy, whether people talk about retraining, is an increasing inequality in the resources to be able to adapt. So I look at my community now and I can see that the biggest challenge is whether kids have access to the bank of mum and dad. It's not actually about whether they go to a good school because a good school isn't enough and I can fight for good schools. It's not actually about whether they might make it all the way through sixth form, might go on to university or might do an apprenticeship because probably one degree or one training course isn't going to be enough. It's about having access to those resources, financial networks, cultural and resilience that allow them to be adaptable. And in that process, the bank of mum and dad is the thing that makes a difference. What I think is quite interesting now is that that isn't just a challenge for 18-year-olds, it's a challenge 
for practically every generation, probably under the age of 50. Well, let's talk specifically about one of the things that comes up in discussions like this a lot, which is universal basic income, which, mm. I, Nick, I know that you've written about. Give us the kind of pitch for what it is and what you think it can do. So I, I've made an argument for universal basic income in the past. I have to admit that I'm somewhat more skeptical of it now, but I'll make the case for it, and then I'll try and explain why uh, I've sort of stepped back a little bit from it. Uh, the idea of a universal basic income is that, uh, say, every month, the state would provide everybody in the state with uh, a certain minimum amount of money. And this would be regardless of anything else. It'd be, uh, you wouldn't have to prove, for instance, that you'd gone looking for a job. You wouldn't have to prove anything. You would just get this money every single month. Now, this sounds quite radical. It is. Uh, but the logic behind it is that it's a response to the threat of job losses from automation. So the situation we may very likely find ourselves in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the line is a situation where there's far more people than there are jobs available. And at that point in time, it makes no difference how hard you are looking for a job, it makes no difference how hard you've educated yourself, how hard you're working, there simply isn't enough jobs for people in the, jo in the labor force. So at that point in time, we need to find other ways to allow people to get an income when they can't find a job. Now, universal basic income is a response to that. It's also a response to the fact that a lot of the work that we do nowadays is unpaid work. So this could be care work done in the home for children, for elderly parents, for sick partners. It can be cooking and cleaning work that's done in the home. I've done the stats on this for my, my latest research, and for an OECD country, it's anywhere from 40 to 50% of our time is spent doing unpaid work. So there's a huge amount of work right now that goes unrecognized, and a universal basic income would be one way to recognize that. Now, the reason why I'm somewhat skeptical of it now is because I think it's a long-term project. I don't think a plausible, meaningful, substantial universal basic income will appear in the next five years, even within the next 10 years, maybe 20 years, 30 years down the line. We could have a basic income that provided people with a decent living, but I think if we were to get a universal basic income tomorrow, it would likely be very, very low. It would likely still force people into work. It wouldn't have all these sort of beneficial aspects of it. So I think a shorter working week right now is something we should be mobilizing for in the short term while still thinking about a universal basic income in the long term. Jamie, do you want to come in on this? I agree with uh, a lot of what Nick says. I think you need to look at both the words universal and the words basic. On the universal front, I think there is a reasonable argument to be made that it's not an e economically efficient or socially just use of society's resources to pay 10,000, 20,000 pounds a year to a rich pensioner or to a large landowner or to the son of a wealthy heir. And it's inherently an inefficient way of moving society around resources rather than uh, moving society's resources around rather than say targeting, targeting them towards the least well off. But on the basic front, I think it's really important when you think about the UBI to ask whether you are talking about today's world or a world of technological unemployment. If you're talking about today's world, I think you have to be suspicious of Silicon Valley types who favor it, because what they really mean when they talk about universal basic income is not in addition to the state provider's social security that we already get, for instance, with nationalized health care, you also just get some money to play with every month. What they mean is you stop funding the rest of social services, you give that money to people, people then spend that money on the free market, where they buy their health care, or they buy their health insurance, or they buy their education for their children. So there's actually a model of universi universal basic income, which is favored by a lot of people stateside, which isn't really left-wing at all. It's kind of, uh, a, 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 in a sense, a regression to a model of the state in which the state does as little possible public spending. Um, and then there's a question of how basic it is. If you have a world of technological unemployment, and half the people in this room don't have a source of uh, income, it can't really be a basic income. If you're getting $1,000 a month, for instance, which is what's been paid out in some of the trial UBIs in small communities around the world, um, in today's economy, that's not gonna take you very far. So either you're, you're actually providing people with an actual income to substitute for the income that they've lost to automation, or what you're really doing is keeping people just above a, a relatively low threshold of subsistence or poverty, 
um, depending on how the economy grows and how far the pound or dollar takes you in the future, um, in which case it doesn't seem that kind of utopian at all. So I think once you break down the UBI and you look at the different varieties of it, you can see that the arguments for it aren't always that progressive and they're not always that clear cut either. Well, Stada, I wonder you bring you in first on this one because I think that it's a discussion that we keep coming back to when we talk about the future work for a simple reason, which is the history of relations between kind of capital and labor, not to get all Marxist about it, but <laughs> a feeling very strongly in British politics during the 70s that the trade unions were too dominant, they held the country to ransom, there were strikes all the time, followed by Thatcherite economics in the in the 80s, it was very much about you know, readjusting that balance. And now I think there is a general perception among people that the balance has swung far too far the other way and people are being forced into degrading, unpleasant, poorly rewarded work. And that actually what we should aim for is we should tighten up again the kind of, you know, the kind of supplicant position that people are put in, into in regards to work. The way you are you know, now, if you're an, uh, on universal credit or job, um, seekers allowance, you have to take anything, absolutely anything, which is not a recipe for making those jobs at the lower end, good, humane, decently paid jobs. Yeah, and I, th I mean, I think one of the challenges here is that actually people are either extremely pessimistic or overly naive about the world and, uh, and the insecurity that people now have to deal with. 15% uh, of my local community in Walthamstow is self-employed. And some of that is because the industries that those people worked in, that's now where their industry has gone. And for other people, it's been an opportunity. But actually, what we've tried to do as a local community is bring people together. So we set up a union for self-employed people in Walthamstow. It's called IndieCube because we recognize that actually for people living with that level of insecurity, and a lot of those people for whom the universal basic income is supposed to be the panacea, it's not just about the money, it's also about the insecurity and the isolation that comes from that. Our long-term plan is to copy some of the things that are happening in, I think it's in Holland, a thing called Bread Fund, where actually you as a community come together to provide the maternity pay, the, 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 the sick pay, the holiday pay that people who are self-employed don't have. And actually, we've been trying to talk to the DWP about working with them over universal credit. Universal credit is a good example of where universal basic income is a terrible idea in the, in the kind of traditional sense of it. Where I think there are lessons that we can learn, where there are UBI schemes that I do think it's worth exploring, are in countries where they've recognized that as particular industries and major employers have collapsed, and so whole communities have been decimated, as particularly in France, for example, around agriculture, they've looked at UBI schemes for whole communities for a time-limited period. And actually, in this country, we have a track record of where we've looked at communities. Say, for example, when the mining industry collapsed, you've seen the knock-on effect for a whole community of that level of poverty, leading not just to declines of individual families, but whole areas, because there hasn't been the people spending money in the local area. Um, I look at things like the New Deal for Community and think, could we have done that better if actually we put the money directly in the hands of people for, say, five years to help those communities transition? Some communities, I mean, this is, this is why people kind of, when they, they glamorize um, the foregone era when people work down the mines, and I look at communities like Barnsley now, which have one of the most fast forward high tech communities because they've been able to transform that community and transform people's skill sets. They've been able to deal with what could have been the massive economic shock that I think UBI is sometimes used to address. Actually, New Deal was part of that. Is there a future project for New Deal for communities where big employers go, where you say for a time-limited period you will have a guaranteed income that helps you make that transition and therefore helps us with a bread fund scheme, helps us when you start your new businesses, helps you retrain? I think that's more interesting and probably more progressive than a universal scheme that could see you know, kids who went to Eton getting that money as much as people who are being stuck with universal credit. So let me bring you in then, Jack, because... One of the other questions I think that's very important when we have this discussion is about the relationship between work and identity. Do you feel like you would be you if you didn't do the job that you did? If you lived in this kind of post-work world where you just learned to play the flute and learned Swahili and, you know, and did that, how, how important to you is as your, a part of your identity is your work? Well, I don't really have a strong idea about what the self is. But I do want to pick up on a different Fair kind enough. of... Uh, I take perhaps more of a Taoist approach in that sense. I'm very suspicious of ideas of personality. However, what I would say is I just want to kind of maybe see if I can understand what's being said here. I mean, UBI to me always seems kind of, in a sense, epiphenomenal or sort of peripheral to another type of debate, which is often not discussed. And I approach this in a very kind of uh, uh, abstract sense, which is two things. First thing is to continue the Marxist line of thought. Of course, Engels in the housing question, he points out that you can't just build workers' cottages to solve a housing crisis because actually 
first of all, all you'll create is an entire population of enslaved workers living in miniature cottages. And secondly, first there must be... Uh, Cut them, isn't it? <laughs> First, there must be a kind of communist uh, revolution for the redistribution of wealth, and then you will find a way to build truly communist housing. Um, when I think about something like UBI, at least for me, the biggest risk that's uh, contained within it is that you end up basically creating a kind of a dependency or sort of slave wage. Um, and it seems to me that in a way, kind of a lot of the questions that are around it is like, where is all the money? You know, like wh where is all the money? Why isn't there enough money? And David Graeber has a fantastic description of the historical origins of money as being related to, to Sumerian kings and uh, the army. You know, armies used to be very slow to move around. Uh, they had long baggage trains behind them of people providing them with their wives and children and food and so on. And so the kings realized that they could create kind of leather tokens, give them to the army, and then force peasants that if they didn't provide a certain number of uh, leather tokens back at the end of the year, they'd be evicted from their land. So every time the army stopped, all of these peasants with their vegetables and produce would rush up to try and trade it and barter it to get leather tokens from the army. And in a sense, then, we understand money as being simply a mechanism for the production and sustenance of society, right? So where is all the money gone? I mean, so much of the money in our sort of closed global financial system has leaked out and formed pools of hyper-accumulation in tax havens. It seems to me like discussions of how to redistribute the little that remains seems kind of peripheral to the discussion of what happened to the rest of it in the first place. And that would be my point. No, I think it's a perfectly reasonable point, and I don't think any of us would think that there is a future work that doesn't address the fact that there are types of work which create very little social value, but create an enormous amount of financial value, right? And that is one of the things that we have to grapple with. I find it fascinating always that we've lost entirely the idea of the kind of Bourneville type philanthropic capitalism of the late 19th century. You know, the idea that there is any responsibility for our, from a business to do anything other than maximize shareholder value, right? That yeah. business have a social responsibility. Although, to be clear, with Bourneville, of course, they were building those workers' uh, uh, complexes in order to do the type of thing which I described before, which is to make better relaxed uh, and well-rested workers to create higher productivity in the factories. I think we can be quite cynical of that. On the other hand, that lineage, of course, created a huge diversity of what we might call a kind of privatized or atomized welfare state, which throughout the course of the 20th century was first nationalized and uh, unified and then sold off. And in fact, through that process of unification, uh, it became fungible. Asking a question like, how much is the post office worth in 1970 didn't make any sense. As soon as you start to commodify things in that way, then the question of whether or not they should be state controlled becomes an open one. Okay, Jamie, so that, when we have that conversation that does is part of has to be part of the automation conversation right because the key question that we're asking about that is who will own the robots are these collective robots or are they in the hands of Richard Branson basically I, I completely agree and and uh, I think if, if Marx were here he would he, he wouldn't say focus on the money and I think if we say well if we just release all the money that's in tax havens then the question of redistribution is made easier no doubt paying tax uh, and particularly big, big tech companies paying their fair share of tax. It's a huge public policy issue, but it's small fry compared to the issues of technological unemployment that we're talking about. And the real uh, thing to focus on for me is not money, but capital, particularly the capital that is uh, useful for producing wealth in the future. If it's not people who are making money through use of their productive powers, it's robots, it's servers, it's data, it is the capital of the future, productive capital, which right now is being funneled into fewer and fewer hands, and it's no secret where it is. Um, the whole of the American economy right now is tending towards monopoly, and no more so than in the tech realm. And if it's the case that almost all wealth in the future is going to be generated by those who own and control particular technologies, AIs, um, the hardware that, that uh, is used to service those AIs, then absolutely the question of who owns and controls that is going to become really important. That's why you're going to hear calls for nationalization. It should be owned by everyone. You're gonna hear calls for robot taxes. If you own that kind of capital, it, it should be taxed and the money should be redistributed around society. You're gonna hear calls for usufructuary rights where the rest of us have a right to use capital even if we don't own it. So one day a week we can go down to the municipal data center or the municipal AI and do our jobs there because we don't have access to that technology without that kind of 
um, without that kind of resource. You'll hear increasing calls for a sharing economy or for data and information to be shared in a commons because your use of one piece of valuable information uh, doesn't mean that I can't use it as well. We need to rethink the way that we structure property in society. And I think that if you just focus on money, uh, then you might miss the underlying, the deep underlying uh, economic changes that um, we're trying to identify. And Nick, I want to put that question to you about the link between identity and work, because it's something that if you get into the UBI discussions particularly, it's something that comes up again and again. Where do you stand on it? So I think the way that our societies are structured now is that work is absolu absolutely essential to our identity. Uh, so when you meet somebody for the very first time, you ask them, oh, what do you do? You always mean, what is their job? You never mean, what do you do for fun? What is your hobby? Uh, and that is sort of central to our identity, the way that we think of ourselves, the way that we represent ourselves to the rest of society. Uh, it, it's absolutely central. And I think one of the big questions for a project like mine, which wants to end work, is how do we rethink identity in that sort of world? Uh, and I don't think there's any easy answer to it, but of course, we do do other things than work. And actually, we oftentimes make this you know, conceptual separation between life and work. And we need to be putting much more emphasis on that life aspect uh, rather than this work aspect. So I think that putting more emphasis on that, starting to consider ourselves not as workers, but as people with proper lives outside of our jobs, um, that's a key point of it. The other sort of thing is that work is oftentimes, for a lot of people, uh, the way that we meet others. So once you get done in schooling, uh, oftentimes the workplace is the only way that you meet a lot of new people. So people coming in and everything, um, you oftentimes can meet your partner through the workplace. But this is, uh, again, something that sort of disappears in a post-work world. What is the replacement for that sort of thing? And I think we need to be considering uh, alternative ways of building up social networks, alternative ways of uh, building up identities when the workplace is no longer so central. Well, I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to have to finish in a second, but I'm going to start with you, Stan, and I'm going to ask you all a very unfair question, which is if people are today are going to go away and they're either going to read one thing, find out about one thing, or make one political demand, <laughs> what's the one thing to take away from this discussion? In a sentence. <laughs> Just to make it harder. That's harder. Um, don't be frightened. But when I was a kid, we used to go into a shop to book a holiday, right? The world is changing very quickly and it's changing before our eyes, but there's a huge opportunity out there. The challenge for us is to make sure that everybody can benefit from these changes, that everybody has a stake in how we decide what happens to that data. So don't be frightened. Be focused on making sure that each of us can benefit from it. Okay. You know. Jack, your take And away. don't be a travel agent. Don't be <laughs> uh, I think remove work from the way in which you talk to other people. Never ask someone what they're working on. Never ask them what they do. Ask them how their day was. Don't make a judgment about the idea that what they do during the day has some economic value to it. Nick? Uh, I think we're seeing right now the most radical concentration of power and resources in the hands of a few that we've seen in at least a century, and our response needs to be as equally as radical. Jamie? When you think about new technologies, don't just look at them as consumers, look at them as citizens. Ask, is this right? Should this be changing? And what can I do about it? Well, there you have it. It just remains for me to say thank you very much to my panel and to the Serpentine Gallery and to Intelligence Squared. Thank you. Thank you.